This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm Chris Mack, and this is Lecture 10 on Thermal Oxidation. This is Part 1 of our lectures that will cover the topic of thermal oxidation, and today we'll focus mostly on the tools and some of the basics of uh, the thermal oxidation process. Our reading is Chapter 4 of our Campbell textbook. So, why silicon dioxide? How is it used in the semiconductor process? Well, we've seen some um, examples of the use of silicon dioxide in the previous lecture on the CMOS process flow, but our two main purposes uh, are, one, to provide for electrical insulation between electrical components, and second, to be used as a dopant diffusion barrier. Uh, dopants in silicon will diffuse in silicon, most of the dopants will diffuse in silicon much faster than they'll diffuse in silicon dioxide, so we can use silicon dioxide as a barrier to prevent diffusion. There's lots of process steps uh, where we use silicon dioxide. We've seen it in the device isolation, and we'll talk more about this uh, later in, in the semester. Um, there's the locos process, the local oxidation of silicon used in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and then by the 90s, we had switched to STI, shallow trench isolation. Uh, so that's the dominant isolation technique used today. We use oxide to, to isolate one transistor from another. We use oxides for the gate oxide. In the MOS transistor, the O is an oxide, and uh, silicon dioxide forms a very good gate oxide, uh, gate insulator. We use it for the polysilicon gate spacer. Um, we put a spacer on the outside of the polysilicon gates, and we use that for the lightly doped, lightly doped drained process. And um, the inner layer dielectric to, to isolate metal levels and uh, to between metal lines in a single level. That's called the inner layer dielectric. It's basically the insulator surrounding the copper lines uh, wiring up our transistors. And then there's several places where we'll use an oxide as a sacrificial layer for implanting through or just as a part of the process that will eventually get stripped off. There are two main methods for depositing silicon dioxide. Um, what we're going to talk about today is thermal growth of the silicon dioxide. And later in the semester, we'll talk about chemical vapor deposition used for silicon dioxide and many other uh, materials that we need to deposit on our wafer. The thermal oxidation process is an oxide growth. What we mean by that is um, we supply oxygen to the surface of the silicon wafer. The oxygen reacts with the silicon at the surface, and silicon dioxide is formed at that surface. It literally grows on top of the silicon. So uh, the oxygen is applied, the silicon has to come from the wafer to form silicon dioxide. These oxides are very valuable because of their the quality, not just the properties as an insulator, but their quality as good insulators. Um, they're stable, they're intrinsically good uh, in, in that regard, but when we grow them, they turn, they grow very clean and uh, pure. And maybe even the most important is because we're growing rather than depositing a layer on top of the silicon, the interface between silicon and silicon dioxide uh, go, starts at the top and then goes down as the growth proceeds. And so the interface uh, occurs at a layer of silicon that's down buried inside the wafer. Uh, the result is an extremely clean interface, and especially in the gate structure, a clean interface between silicon and silicon dioxide results in good electrical properties. The basic way in which we uh, perform this silicon oxide growth is in an oxidation furnace. And furnaces are going to be used not just for oxidation, but also for other important processes in semiconductor manufacturing, in particular CVD. So we're going to see furnaces again. Here I show a cross-section of a 
of a horizontal furnace. There's also vertical furnaces oriented uh, vertically. But let's, let's focus on the horizontal furnace first. Uh, uh, it's all the same basic components anyway. Now what do we have? We begin with a fused silica tube. That's this uh, tube uh, that we're going to put our wafers in. Um, most people call it a quartz tube, but it's not really quartz. It's not a crystalline material. It's actually uh, amorphous, which is fused silica. Um, this fused silica can withstand very, very high temperatures, and we're going to perform this oxidation at temperatures up to 1200 degrees C. The wafers are loaded here uh, in a boat, and you see they're stacked uh, vertically and will fit 25 or 50 or 100 wafers in a row in this boat. The boat is silicon carbide. It has to be a material that can withstand high temperatures without reacting. And then that boat is attached to a paddle, a long uh, cantilevered paddle that allows us to stick the boat of wafers into the tube without touching the tube. And that's, that's important. Uh, we'll get better performance if this whole contraption never touches any of the, the sidewalls. Uh, you know, we're, we're growing material um, here on the wafers themselves, but we also get reactions at the quartz tube, uh, the fused silica tube surface, and if our boat ever hit the surface, it'd generate lots of particles and it would be a disaster from a defect perspective. We also have surrounding, looping around uh, this, this, this tube, heating elements. And we'll turn on these heating elements to adjust the temperature and get the temperature we want and the temperature profile that we want. We'll talk more about that later. So we have a boat with wafers in it and a furnace that we can heat up. Next thing we need is our reactants. Our reactants are input here through a, con a set of valves and input gas lines. Uh, we might have a bubbler uh, if we want to input water. Uh, one of the ingredients might be, uh, might be water. Um, we might have uh, just plain old oxygen coming through, but we'll also have some carrier gases, inert gases like argon and nitrogen that carry our reactants through, and we might add some other uh, components that we, we want, and we'll talk about that and various valves and controllers, flow rate controllers, mass flow controllers that ensure that we get the proper flow of the proper materials into the furnace. One of the most important aspects of a furnace is temperature control. As I said, we have a number of uh, temperature heating coils wrapped around the tube. Each one is individually controlled so that we can adjust the temperature. Um, what we want, want is a uniform temperature across all of those wafers. Uh, but if we look at the temperature versus position, eventually we're going to have some place where we don't have any heating coils and the temperature goes down. To get a maximum flat zone, what we'll do is take the last uh, temperature uh, coil and heat it up higher than uh, it needs to be so that it ramps up a little bit and then falls down and that gives us the best flat zone. Uh, we need something like 0.5 degrees C temperature control requirements. Because of that and because of the, the nature of the flow of the gas, we'll actually put a few one or two or three dummy wafers on the ends, uh, both ends of this boat, this carrier, uh, so that um, only the middle wafers, which have the maximum uniformity, are actually our production wafers that we want to use. We'll do oxidation at temperatures anywhere from 600 to 1200 degrees C. Now another important aspect of the um, process is the thermal cycle. These furnaces are these long, long tubes uh, the, the cycles take hours, maybe up to 24 hours to perform the oxidation, but sometimes as little as an hour to perform this oxidation. Um, but because it's a, a long process, we want to process a whole bunch of wafers at once, not one at a time, but you know, 100 wafers at once. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take a boat of wafers like this and we'll put it in the carrier 
and then we'll push it in to the tube. So back here is the tube, furnace tube, and then here we have our um, uh, auto, uh, drivers that push the paddles in and pull it out when it's done. It's all automated, computer controlled, and you see it's a stack, of, in this case, of four furnaces, uh, one on top of each other. We can have multiple processes going at once. The first thing we're going to do is push the wafers into the furnace. So we'll, we'll bring the wafers up to a reasonably high temperature. And here I show 750 degrees. But then we'll push the wafers into the tube um, at that temperature. Uh, it will be uh, in a nitrogen environment, so inert gas inside the tube as we do this. But we'll add just a little bit of oxygen too, uh, which prevents the formation of silicon nitride. Once the wafers are in the tube, we'll begin ramping up the temperature. This ramp up is also in a nitrogen environment um, with, again, a little bit of oxide to prevent silicon nitride formation. Once it reaches a stable temperature, so we let it stabilize for a little while uh, at the desired temperature, then we'll begin oxidation. So at some point here, we'll introduce our oxide and uh, as we'll see, or oxygen rather, and as we'll see, we'll add some hydrogen chloride as well. I'll explain the reason for that later. We go through the oxide process, the oxid oxidation process for one hour, two hours, six hours, however long we need to get the desired thickness, and then we'll turn off the gases and add nitrogen again. Uh, we'll ramp down in a nitrogen environment slowly, um, this also serves as an anneal. Uh, finally, we'll pull. When it reaches down at a, at a much lower temperature, we'll pull it out. Now, we push it in and pull it out at a low temperature um, because we don't want to shock the wafers and cause too much thermal stress. Uh, let's go through that thermal oxidation cycle again, talking about some of the details. First, the push. We use a low temperature to reduce thermal stress. If it, if it's too high of a temperature. When we bring it in, we get warpage of the wafers. Um, we use a little bit of oxide, oxygen to prevent the formation of silicon nitride uh, during that process. Then we have two kinds of oxidations, dry and wet. We'll talk about that more in our next lecture. But in, here I'd just like to mention, uh, if we do a dry oxidation, what that means is our reactant material is pure oxygen and then we add a little bit of hydrogen chloride. I'll explain the purpose of the hydrogen chloride soon. Dry oxidation is slow. It takes a long time to grow. So we only use dry oxidation for relatively thin oxides. Um, if you want to grow a really thick oxide in, in a dry process, it can take a long time, 24 hours or more. Uh, but sometimes we need really high quality films because the highest quality films occur in dry oxidation. Wet oxidation means we, we introduce water into the reactant gases. It's actually a combination of O2 and H2O as the reactant gases. It is fast. We can grow thicker oxides much more quickly, but it's a little denser, not quite as good an electrical insulator. Uh, the interface states, which we'll talk about, are not quite as good. And as a result, when we want the highest quality films, we'll use uh, dry oxidation. The N2 anneal, when we're done with the ox oxidation process, we'll put in nitrogen. We'll let it sit there for a little while. And this reduces the surface states. And finally, we ramp down and pull out slowly uh, to have low stress and also low surface states, low fixed charge. What is this surface states, fixed charge, quality of the film that I've been talking about? Well, these are forms of electrical defects. Uh, here I show uh, the fixed charge, for example. What is that? Well, this is incompletely oxidized silicon. So right at the surface, when we, uh, we might have some silicon that's right there where the silicon dioxide should be, but it's not quite fully oxi oxidized yet. Uh, and as a result, we have some fixed charge associated with the silicon. We also can have interface trapped charge. 
These are dangling silicon bonds. So this is in the silicon, but the dangling bond is sticking up into the silicon dioxide, and as a result, there can be some uh, uh, trapped charge on those dangling bonds. These are the interface states. But also in the bulk, we can have uh, electrical defects. We can have trapped charge in the oxide itself. These are broken silicon oxygen bonds uh, that as a result of, of being broken can trap a, either a positive or a negative charge. And finally, we can have contamination. Things like sodium and potassium are the most damaging contaminants uh, in our process. And in fact, some of the very early work in semiconductor technology in the 60s, it was very, very difficult to make MOS technology function until we learned how to get rid of these contaminants because they're mobile. And that what's, that's what makes them so deadly. Uh, they, they can move around under the influence of an electric field. We want this to be an insulator. If we apply a voltage and charge moves, well, that's a current, and that's not a very good insulator. So we have to make sure we don't have these mobile charges inside of our film. How do we ensure the quality of the films that we grow? Well, first of all, we have to make sure we don't have mobile ions. These contamination-based uh, ions. Uh, some ions, of course, are worse than others, but we don't want any mobile ions at all. Uh, what do we do? We'll, we make sure we clean our wafers. So we pre-clean before we begin the oxid oxidation process, get rid of any contaminants that might be on the surface of the wafer. Uh, we have to carefully handle these wafers on the backside. So after you clean them, you still have to pick up the wafers and move them around, and we tend to do that by backside handling. Grab them from the backside, not the front. We almost never touch the front of a wafer in any of the processing steps. But even touching the backside can generate contamination if we're not careful. We have to make sure our furnace components are clean, and then this is why we use HCl. We can add HCl during the oxidation process. What does that do? Well, chlorine is going to react with the mobile ions. The worst uh, mobile ions are the positively charged ions, like small ones like sodium and potassium. Chlorine will react with them and neutralize them so that they, they're not a problem. It does result in excess chlorine in the oxide film, but that's not as big a problem as the mobile ions. Chlorine doesn't move around very much. We also have interface states. These are the fixed charge and the interface trap charge, and we need to try to make sure that those are not a problem, uh, minimize the amount of interface states. How do we do that? Well, we avoid stress. This causes oxide-induced stacking faults, um, kind of messes up the crystal structure right at the interface, and uh, this can result in more dangling bonds and more fixed charge and interface trap charge. We use nitrogen or argon during the pull uh, at, to anneal and reduce the st stresses that can result in the dangling bonds. And finally, the use of HCl during oxidation can also uh, grab up these uh, fixed charge and neutralize them. The other aspect of quality that we worry about in oxidation is thickness control. We need to make sure we get the right thickness and the right uniformity of that thickness. Uh, that has to be good thickness control across the wafer for any individual wafer. Good thickness control wafer to wafer as we stack all of these wafers in the boat. Every wafer needs to be the same. And finally, we're going to process these one lot after another in a manufacturing environment, and the lot to lot thickness control also has to be good. It turns out vertical furnaces have better temperature uniformity and therefore better thickness control, as we'll see next time. Any change in temperature results in a change in the thickness because it affects the growth rate, the rate at which the oxide grows. So we need good temperature control if we want good thickness control. Vertical furnaces have better temperature uniformity. Why don't you think about why that might be true? All right, what have we learned in lecture 10, our first lecture on thermal oxidation? Well, you should be able to answer all these questions quite easily. If you can't, you need to go back and review the lecture again. What is oxide, silicon dioxide, used for in a CMOS process? What are the advantages of thermal oxidation versus, say, CVD?
explain the basic workings of an oxidation furnace. Why is HCl used in the oxidation process? And finally, how does one ensure good oxide thickness uniformity during thermal oxidation? Well, that's our first lecture on thermal oxidation. Next time, we're going to talk about the Deal-Grove model of oxide growth. Thanks, and see you then.